we have step three, and in step three, what are we going to do? We're going to say, well, let's determine the transaction price. Here, step three is blissfully simple. We've got 250 bucks per system, 1,000 systems, so we've got 250,000. Uh, we're going to spend uh, time later in, in this discussion on how step three can get much more complicated. Okay, then step four. Now we have to allocate that transaction price to the performance obligations. Uh, and, and we do that based on their standalone selling prices. These might be observable. Uh, we might sell them separately, as TrueTech does, but they might not, in which case we're in the position of estimating them. We have two different performance obligations here, delivering try boxes and delivering the subscriptions, so we'll allocate based on their standalone selling prices. For the try box, let me see, it's 240 for try boxes and 60 for the Trinet subscription normally. So we've got 240 over 300 or 80% that gets allocated to the try box. So for every 250 sale of a try box system, we're going to have 200 of that that gets allocated to the performance obligation of delivering try box modules. And then we've got the Trinet subscription, which gets the rest, 60 over 300 or 20%. And so we've got this allocation process that's inherent, and we have to do that allocation unless, you know, there's, there's pretty clear evidence that any discount of price from a, a, a package deal only relates to one of the performance obligations. Okay, and then what do we do? Well, now we really treat these things separately. We've got two different deals here. We've got the delivery of TriBox modules, and 200,000 is associated with that, and we've got the delivery of uh, access to the Trinet over a year, and uh, what, 50,000 associated with that. And so we're going to have to record revenue, and we'll book our receivable of 250,000. We'll recognize sales revenue immediately for delivery of the TriBox modules, but we'll book the deferred revenue associated with the Trinet subscriptions, set up that liability, and then over time, we'll take that liability down just like we did before, but because only 50,000 was allocated to the liability rather than 60,000 as a standalone. Uh, we had 50,000 of deferred revenue, and we're going to have less revenue that we recognize each period. We're still, of course, going to take the deferred revenue down to zero, and we're still going to uh, recognize service revenue as we go. So that's kind of it. If we think about this Part A, and if we think about summarizing these basic steps, uh, one of the things that we have periodically in the chapter are, are these kinds of, of summaries where you can see that on the left are the steps that we walk through, and then on the right are the fundamental issues that we've just talked about. Uh, figuring out when you've got a contract, determining whether you've got separate performance obligations, uh, determining the transaction price, and allocating that transaction price, and then recognizing revenue at a point in time, transfer control over a period of time if you meet one of those three criteria. So that's kind of part A, and one way to think about this is if an instructor is just trying to give a flavor for this new standard, uh, part A is pretty easy to teach, particularly if they already understand the basics of recognizing revenue at a point in time and over a period of time. Uh, and of course, if someone has already been teaching multiple deliverable contracts, like EITF uh, 0021, this is basically the same approach. There's an allocation of the transaction price and then recognizing revenue associated with the pieces. So uh, uh, we think this is a pretty nice way to introduce people to uh, the new standard, and, and, and if they want, at this point, they can stop. But boy, there's a lot more to it. So uh, let's think about some of the other things that are going on in the standard and that therefore we include in our Part B. Uh, what I've got here are, are the steps and, and uh, thinking about issues that come up with each of these steps. And that's actually how Part B is is uh, uh, organized because the idea is to help students plug into that five-step framework. So step one, you know, there's some specific requirements associated with determining whether, whether you have a contract or what are the characteristics of a contract. Uh, step two, uh, that, remember, was figuring out your, your separate performance obligations. And there are some things that are tricky here. Uh, how do you deal with prepayments? Uh, quality assurance or extended warranties, customer adoption uh, options for, for, for different stuff. Uh, those can be or cannot be 
separate performance obligations depending on if they meet these uh, criteria for being distinct. Step three, estimating uh, transaction price. We're going to be focusing on variable consideration. That's why I've got it in red. Uh, but, you know, here it crops up right of return, principal versus agent, time value of money, payments by the seller. Uh, step four, uh, where we have to allocate based on standalone selling prices, well, if they're not observable, you have to estimate the standalone selling prices, so we deal with that. And then step five are lots of sort of troublesome contractual features that affect the timing of revenue recognition. So license arrangements, those can get complicated. Uh, dealing with franchises under this new standard, bill and hold arrangements, consignments, gift cards. And then finally, a, a big thing with this new standard is disclosure. Uh, I think one of the things that in practice people are most scared of is just the volumes of disclosure that the standard seems to be requiring. Uh, and so we, we walk through that, but frankly, that's going to be something that, that gets nailed down and develops over the next couple of years as, as this standard comes online. So again, what I want to do is to drill down on this one topic, uh, recognizing variable consideration. And so with variable consideration, what we're thinking about is, is that part of the transaction price depends on the outcome of some future event. So this is, a, this is a contingent loss or contingent gain situation. And in particular, we're accustomed in revenue recognition to not recognizing revenue associated with contingent gains until the uncertainty resolves. Uh, so here, we're, we're going to be doing some things that we're not used to doing. It's going to be very judgmental. And there's a lot of concern that this could open the door to, to earnings management to, to some problems. Lots of examples show up of, of these kinds of arrangements. Uh, it, it's, it's important to think pretty broadly when you're thinking about variable consideration. Anything that dials up or down the amount the seller's entitled to receive uh, falls under this umbrella. So uh, in entertainment and media, royalties, uh, health care, uh, any kind of reimbursements from Medicare and Medicaid, manufacturing, volume discounts, product returns, uh, construction, dealing with uh, incentive uh, payments, telecommunications, dealing with rebates, things that are playing around with that transaction price are going to fall under this uh, uh, criterion. And, and the standard specifies that what we need to do is go through uh, either an expected value or most likely amount estimation uh, approach, uh, depending on what the, the person thinks is most appropriate for the contract, which is pretty interesting because some people I know would say an expected value is always more appropriate, right? So, so there's, there's judgment just in figuring out what approach to use to estimate uh, variable consideration, let alone the inputs to that. So, so let's walk through that. And uh, coming back to TrueTech, let's just create a, a contract, and then we're going to uh, account for variable consideration on that contract. So TrueTech enters into a contract with ProSport Gaming to add ProSport's online games to the Tri Network. So ProSport offers a popular game, a brawl of bands, and wants uh, games like that offered on the Trinet so that ProSport can make money selling stuff to people who use the game, selling gems and weapons and health potions and other game features. And if you've got kids that play these online games, you know that this stuff gets very expensive very fast. And, and ProSport's business model is to get their games out there so they can sell this stuff. So on January 1, 2016, ProSport pays TrueTech an upfront fixed fee of $300,000 for six months of featured access. So that's a sure thing. But ProSport also will pay TrueTech a bonus of $180,000 if Trinet users access ProSport games for at least 15,000 hours during the six-month period. And TrueTech estimates a 75% chance that it, will receive, that it will achieve that usage target and get the $180,000 bonus. So we've got variable consideration here of 180,000, and TrueTech goes through some estimation process of coming up with that 75%. So let's think about applying both methods. Uh, you know, we're going to start off just setting up that deferred revenue, but then we got to recognize, we got to, we've got to estimate our our uh, uh, variable transaction price. And to start off, let's think expected value. So we all know how expected values work. You have various possible amounts, and you multiply those by their probabilities to come up with the probability-adjusted expectation. So first off, if we think about this, there's one state of the world where TrueTech gets the bonus, 
So they get the 300,000 base fee plus 180,000 bonus, taking them to 480,000. Multiply that by the 75% price, and or sorry, 75% probability, and that gets us a probability adjusted expectation of 360,000. That's one alternative. The, the sadder part is where we only get 300,000 because our bonus is zero. There's a 25% chance of that happening. So 300,000 times 25%, that takes us to 75,000, and our total expected amount here is, uh, what, 435,000. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, have that be the transaction price that's uh, used to estimate revenue. Now, second, we can think in terms of the most likely amount. And if we're dealing with this as the most likely amount, we're going to have uh, well, it was a 75% chance of 480,000, and so I've got 300 plus 180 is my 480,000. Let's assume that that's the approach that they use to recognize revenue. They base it on this most likely amount. So that means at time zero, they're going to be saying, well, our total transaction price here is going to be 480,000 bucks. And so each period, we're going to recognize a sixth of 480,000 or 80,000 as service revenue. And that means that we're not only going to be taking down that deferred revenue account for 50000 but we're also going to be recognizing a bonus receivable of 30000 each period, and we'll be booking that thing over time. And that's sort of what's really interesting about this new standard, is that you can see that even though this bonus hasn't been reached, we're building uh, a bonus receivable, and we're recognizing revenue for it. And that's pretty different from what we're used to seeing under current GAAP. There's a couple of different outcomes that could occur here. One possibility is they get the bonus. So they accumulate this thing up to 180000 and at the end of the six-month period, they take down their receivable, and they get cash of 180. So one way to think about that is, well, that's a, that's a world in which their, their estimate of variable consideration was correct. The, the downside here is that the estimate of variable consideration was incorrect. And so we build this bonus up over time, taking it to 180, but now we're going to reduce service revenue, uh, debiting down the revenue rather than debiting up a cash asset. Because at the end here is when we realize, oh, we're not going to get the bonus, and so that adjustment happens basically prospectively to revenue. So you can see that there's the potential for some, uh, some revenue uh, shifting here. Let me just check in. Dave, am I doing okay on time? Yeah, Mark, you got about 18 minutes. Oh, beautiful. Okay, that's great. All right, thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just keep rolling along. Okay, so now uh, let's think about a situation where partway through this contract, we get new information, so our estimate changes, right? I mean, so far what we've been assuming is that they estimated this 75-25 probability split and they just kept cranking under that. But what if, what if things change? So now we're going to have uh, TrueTech saying that, you know, after three months, uh, unfortunately, due to low usage of pro sports games, the most likely outcome is that TrueTech won't receive the 180000 bonus. And so we're going to have to, to take into account that really what we need to do is to shift to a world where we recognize revenue based only on the 300,000 fixed fee. So three months have gone by. If you look at the bonus receivable account on the left, you can see that we've got 30,000, 30,000, 30,000. So we've accumulated 90,000 of bonus receivable. And if you look at the service revenue on the right, we've got 80, 80, 80, because we've been assuming we're going to get that bonus. Now in month four in April, we say, uh-oh, uh, we've got to make an adjustment here. It uh, turns out that we need to take our bonus receivable down to zero, and we need to adjust service revenue down. And so you've got a journal entry where you're debiting down revenue and taking that bonus receivable down to zero. And then in subsequent periods, what are you going to do? You're going to be saying, okay, in the remaining three months, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and recognize revenue uh, based on the 300000 that I'm I believe I'm going to end up uh, getting in the end. 
and you can see that eventually you accumulate to having record 300,000 of revenue. And so, you know, in some ways this feels very normal because we're sort of prospectively adjusting an estimate over time. It's just, you know, it's an estimate of a, of a contingent gain, and we're not used to seeing that. So, as you can imagine, this is something that was making people nervous uh, as the ASU was being drafted, as it was going through this whole uh, uh, process of being developed. And so fairly late in the game, it seemed to me, a constraint got introduced to limit how much revenue shifting would occur because of people making aggressive estimates up front that they then revised down later on. And that brings in this constraint on recognizing revenue. Uh, and so the constraint basically says that you're only allowed to recognize revenue associated with variable consideration if uh, it is probable that a significant revenue reversal will not occur when the uncertainty associated with the variable consideration is resolved. And so if you think about that, what it's really sort of saying is, you know, it has to be probable. Your estimate has to be good enough that uh, you're not going to be taking us someplace that, that results in this big uh, uh, shift, this big adjustment down of revenue uh, later on in the game. And, and, of course, this is one of these judgmental criteria. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out with auditors, how aggressive or conservative firms are in determining whether or not the constraint applies. Uh, there's an indicator model used to determine whether the constraint uh, applies. Uh, so what are, what are circumstances that suggest that that, that revenue reversal could, could occur? Uh, poor, sort of limited evidence on which to base an estimate. Dependence on the estimate. Uh, of the estimate on factors outside the, the seller's control, a history of the seller changing payment terms on similar contracts, broad range of outcomes, long delay, basically all the sorts of things that you would think would make it difficult for a seller to know what's going to happen. And uh, as we crank up that uncertainty, uh, we crank up the concern that a significant revenue reversal could be probable and therefore the constraint could apply, which would prevent uh, the seller from recognizing revenue until they determine that that, that probability constraint's been satisfied. So just to see how that works, let's play with our contract again. Let's assume that TrueTech initially concludes that it's not probable that a significant revenue reversal will not occur in the future. So sorry for the double negative, but the basic idea here is the constraint is applying. They don't think they can argue successfully that it's probable that they're not going to have that significant revenue reversal in the future. So they're going to start off recognizing revenue each month based on the 300,000 initial uh, uh, fixed fee, so taking down deferred revenue and recognizing service revenue. Now assume that after three months, uh, TrueTech concludes that it now can make an accurate enough bonus assessment for uh, it to be probable that a significant revenue reversal will not occur. And they are still estimating the bonus as the most likely amount. They're still estimating a 75% likelihood. Well, then what do we have to do? We have to do sort of the opposite of the adjustment we saw previously. Now we have to say, oh, we've got to catch this thing up. We've got to put 90000 of bonus receivable on the books have this bump to service revenue, and then in the last three months, we're going to be recognizing the takedown of deferred revenue of 50, we'll be accruing bonus revenue of 30, and, and recognizing service revenue of 80. So, so you can see, see that this is being handled prospectively too, uh, but once that constraint is viewed as no longer necessary to be in place, then we're going to get a little bit of a, of a, of a bump in revenue. Uh, truing things up to where they'd be if the constraint had never been in place.